Hello everyone and welcome to our Functional Genomics webinar. My name is Danielle and on behalf of Oxford Global, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Today, we have two fantastic speakers leading this webinar, Sir Hilseth from the MD Anderson Cancer Centre and Paul Deal from Selector. After the presentations, Sir Hill and Paul will host a Q&A session. Please submit your questions through our question option display. The full recording of this webinar will be made available to download on our secure website and the details will be sent to you after the webinar. Without any more delays, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Sir Hill Seth is a scientist at the MD Anderson Cancer Centre, working with the Translational Research to Advanced Therapeutics and Innovation on Oncology group. In the past, he has made contributions to several large-scale cancer genomic studies as part of the Cancer Genome Atlas project. The Hill is interested in studying evolutionary dynamics in cancer and understanding resistance mechanisms that inform the development of target therapies. So Hill, over to your presentation. All right. Um, I would like to start off by thanking the uh, entire team uh, for, for this set of slides which I'm going to present today. Folks from Viale Lab, Dreta Lab, Traction, and Pivnica Firms Lab. And also, I would like to thank uh, patients for generously donating their samples and to the surgical and pathological teams for processing and providing us with the experimental models. So today, we're going to talk about um, a platform which we have developed and, and published several manuscripts with to, to lineage trace tumor cells and to understand the functional heterogeneity uh, within the tumor. This is a, a manuscript from a couple of years ago where folks performed whole exome sequencing across multiple time points to understand what subclones, uh, how subclones react to, to, um, to therapy in, in this case. So this is an AML patient where after chemotherapy, the only one of the subclones, which was initially 5% remained, and then at the time of relapse, that's the subclone which created the entire tumor. Now, these are excellent tools uh, to understand tumor heterogeneity. Apart from longitudinal biopsy, one can also use multi-region sequencing of the tumors and also single cell sequencing to understand the, the intratumor heterogeneity. But we wanted to go a bit further and to actually understand what, how do certain subclones respond to certain therapies? And then uh, is, it, is, it actually, there is, is there actually a difference between how certain subclones respond to say drug A versus drug B and drug C? Uh, to do that, for example, let's assume that we have a tumor which is a simplistic model with just five subclones. And you give drug A and this orange subclone is the one which, which persists and creates the dominant fraction of the tumor upon relapse. A drug B in this case might perform differently in this example shown in green and uh, shown in green are subclones which are persistent to drug B. So we would like to understand how uh, which subclones are sensitive and resistant to which drugs and then design experimental uh, design experimental trials based on that. So imagine a scenario where you could run the same run the same uh, run the same tumor across different drugs and and understand how each of these tumor populations responds. And not just that, imagine you could have a scenario where you could go back in time and isolate some of these uh, specific lineages and understand their somatic somatic variations, copy number variation perform transcription analysis to understand the oncogenic pathway and, and, and also further elucidate on the resistant mechanisms and possible rational therapies. The first disease of focus is pancreatic cancer. As many of you would know, this, is, uh, this, this has very, very bad prognosis and it's the first most common cancer in, in US with a five-year survival rate of only 8.5%. The current standard of care mostly includes chemotherapy, Gemzar, Abraxin, uh, Fulfurinox, etc. And the experimental models we have are a set of 50 PDX models 
for whom we were able to perform RNA seq and whole exome to understand the, the intertumor heterogeneity. The workhorse model is uh, is pa pa Parex 53. This is a Keras P53 mutant with amplifications in uh, in in MIG. Uh, to walk you through the experimental design, so we extract PDX models and uh, we, we extract tumors from, from humans and create PDX models. And once these models are able to replicate in vitro, we are able to infect them with, with this high complexity library. And they, it goes through pyromycin selection and stabilization across several passages. And these stabilized barcodes can then be split and, and we can create a generation of clonal replica tumors. In parallel, after puramycin selection, instead of stabilizing them in vitro, we also attempted to stabilize them in vivo. That is, put transplant the, the, the tumor cells into mice and then subsequently passage them in mice. Then we created a, a processing workflow in terms of the in terms of the, the computational methods to the QC them, the align them, and then perform appropriate normalization, etc. What we see is in terms of the stabilization, after about 15 to 20 passages, only 4% of the subclones remain. And upon transplantation, only about 1.5, 1.6% of the subclones persist. And each of these subclones have very different dynamics. In red, what we are showing are the long-term self-proliferating clones, which sustain over, over passages in vitro, and then also sustain in the transplantation step from the last passage in, in vitro. What we see is uh, clones in blue, which are functionally exhausted, and they die off in, in uh, in, in just a few passages. In green are transiently amplifying, they grow for a certain passages and then finally they exhaust. Orange is another population which is quite interesting. These are initially low represented across in vitro, but they have some sort of advantage in vivo and that's why they are enriched in subsequent passages in vitro and then also in vivo. Now, this is another representation of, of the same dynamics. What I've done is represented 1.5 million barcodes uh, and removed some of, the one, some of the ones which had very low numbers. And then we are following them across passages. Red just signifies that the barcodes are present and gray signifies that the barcodes are not present. By passage five, passage 11, we can see that there is a significant proportion of barcodes which have exhausted themselves. And then finally, after transplantation, we create the clonal replica one. And you see the only a fraction of barcodes represented in red are present. If we compare the composition of the three clonal replica tumors, we see a Pearson correlation of 0 0.99, 0 0.98, suggesting that at this time point, even if we create a, a cohort of mice, all of them would have the same set of barcodes represented in, uh, distributed in, in a, in a practically similar fashion. We studied this in greater detail. And here, instead of showing 1.5 million barcodes, I'm showing you 80,000 top barcodes. And again, we are passage, we are following them in vitro at the panel on top and in vivo at the panel on, on the bottom. You see that there is a significant time difference in where in about eight weeks, we are able to create a tumor uh, using the in vitro passaging and we are able to do a, a similar thing in about 32 weeks in vivo. Now, to understand, we see that uh, you can observe that there is a fraction of, there is an overlap between what clones finally persist in vitro and in vivo represented in red at, at, the, at the rightmost panel. We performed some stochastic modeling where XIJ represents the, the number of barcodes of lineage I at passage J, which is a function of the number of barcodes in, the, in, a, in a previous passage, so J minus one, and also the intrinsic fitness as to, you know, are there certain tumor cells which just have a higher fitness level and some random effect. And we model this in vitro and in vivo. 
And we argued that if there is no intrinsic fitness, then if we were able to do random selection from a previous passage, the, the number of cells which are overlapping would only be a, would only be a, would only be a function of the, their previous size. Uh, at this last passage in vivo, F4, what we see is that there are about 800 clones which are common between the two systems in vitro and in vivo. However, the stochastic, using stochastic modeling, we see that about 73 of them should have been in common. So this clearly suggests that there is a strong intrinsic fitness where there is only a certain subclones which persist over in vitro and in vivo. As you can see that, you know, the, this was forked a long time back, uh, several weeks back, but there is the same subclones which are able to dominate the both systems. Now, after creating these, these clonal replica tumors, we wanted to go further and actually understand how each of them respond to different drugs. We, we gave them three different drugs, and what we can see is, uh, so uh, gemcitabine, BEZ, and AZD, and what we can see is there are certain subclones which are which are sensitive to all of them, and using linear modeling can extract specific patterns. Uh, the the panel on the left hand side bottom shows this specific these specific subclones are are resistant to gemcitabine, but but sensitive to other drugs. And on the rightmost panel, this is an example. This is an example ones which are sensitive to gemcitabine but resistant to others. Now we we use uh, CCA or canonical correspondence analysis to uh, to create a 2D or ordination based on the clonal response. So each dot is a lineage and it's spatially distributed according to the response. And here the log fold change represents how high the clones were upon gemcitabine treatment. And blue represent how low the clones were according to at gemcitabine treatment. And we see that the, the clones which are most resistant to gemcitabine are at the rightmost bottom space of this panel. Since we know what uh, what lineages perform how to specific drugs, uh, although it's not shown here, you can you, we can revert back to the paper and we were able to design a system of using uh, limited dilution and extracting specific sp subclones based on their barcodes and. We extracted about 12 of them and then assessed their response. And what we see here is um, their log fold change represented in um, based on the size. And the, the lineages which are most sensitive are represented in blue, and the two most resistant lineages are represented in red on, on the right hand side. Now, what we have done is we have not just looked at the response in a high throughput manner, we have extracted specific lineages and we can do deeper analysis on these lineages. So we, and we also, just to confirm that their, their behavior, we can see that, well, that is an example, the lineage in blue, which is a sensitive lineage, does not, is not able to really relapse in, in a petri dish, whereas the one in red is, is able to create colonies back again. Now we performed uh, RNA sequencing to understand what pathways are enriched. In, in red and blue, we have two sets of pathways, Hallmark and KEG. What we see is oxidative phosphorylation is something which is uh, incredibly enriched in the resistant lineages. And ECM interaction, IL-5, STAT signaling, et cetera, uh, are, are depleted in these resistant lineages. Based on the, based on these, these RNA-seq patterns of just a few lineages, we created a, a gene expression signature and projected that onto the TCGA cohort. And interestingly, we were able to see a strong difference in survival in a patient population. We, we categorized the patients into three, three categories, resistant, sensitive, and those which we were not able to significantly or confidently uh, attribute to one of the two classes represented in green. And it's interesting to see that the green ones are right in the middle. So basically using the system, we were able to create CRTs or clone replica tumors. We were able to understand the molecular heterogeneity in these long-term self renewal lineages and go deeper in, in gemcitabine response. 
and also just using uh, one model and a few lineages of one model we were able to create a, a predictive signature which translated onto a larger cohort showing if we are able to do deeper analysis uh, or even on a small fraction of, of tumors we are able to find things which are translatable moving on we we performed similar uh, experiments in other cohorts uh, such as breast cancer and uh, here we are switching gears to triple negative breast cancer this is a cancer which is represented by lack of biomarkers so triple negative and um, about 50 percent of them do not respond to chemotherapy using path assessments at the time of surgery pathologists can segregate or categorize them into three four classes so uh, one class for pathological complete response and then three classes of residual cancer burden based on how big the tumor is, tumor involvement of lymph nodes, etc. What we see is that at least 50% or more are categorized in, uh, in RCP2 or RCP3 disease. So this is the, 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 the section, this is the subset of the tumors which we want to focus on to better understand how to target them. Uh, this clinical trial at MD Anderson involves around longitudinal biopsies and it assesses the response of the tumors uh, to AC, to adriamycin and cyclophosphamide. Uh, and the, if, if the patient responds well, uh, then it goes on to use taxing. And if it does not, then several experimental, exper biomarker matched experimental therapies are, are, uh, are provided. Apart from that, longitudinal biopsies are performed and molecular profiling is also done. So whole exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and also creation of PDX models at multiple time points. And this allows us to understand these tumors uh, better. And this is a study in triple negative by our, our colleagues at MD Anderson, where, um, where they looked at, performed single cell sequencing and looked at about 20 patients and how each of them uh, behave upon chemotherapy. As you can see, there are a certain fraction which had pathological complete response. Here they call them clonal extinction and some others clonal persistence where either a subclone, either the subclone architecture does not change or there is a specific subclone which actually enriches and creates the mass of the tumor. In our study, uh, what was done is after creation of the PDXs, the, the mouse cells were depleted and transduced with a lentiviral back, uh, library as similar to the PDX experiment. But instead of going through a, a, a stabilization phase, in a, after about six days of selection, a cohort of about nine tumors was created. And then they were, some of them were uh, of, of, some of them were extracted and stored untreated. Others were treated with AC and then residual tumors were extracted and that's shown on the panel on the right by what we mean residual, uh, you know, less, less than certain amount of the tumor being left. And then regrown tumors where the size almost reaches the, the initial untreated tumors. And several molecular uh, assessments were performed, RNA-C, exome and of course the barcode analysis. So this is looking at for RNA sequencing. What we, what we see is in green are the residual tumors, blue are the, untreat, the untreated or the pretreatment, and in purple are the AC grown. Interestingly, the pretreatment and the AC grown tumors, so basically the regrown tumors, cluster similarly and cluster together. And it's only the AC residual which clusters separately, which is quite interesting. What that suggests is that after treatment, of course, the tumor responds and transcriptionally the pathways change. But after a certain time, after the lineages have stabilized and the dominant subclones have come in, and finally, uh, the, the regrown tumor looks very similar to the pretreatment tumor. If, if we compare the residual, uh, the regrown tumor versus the, the residual tumor versus the vehicle, what we see several pathways like cytoskeleton, cardiac development. Uh, spermatogenesis, etc. Using whole exome sequencing, we can also track the variant allele fractions. And here, uh, what we see is uh, the variant allele frequency on, on the left, 
And we see that interestingly, nothing changes across the, the three different time points. And uh, the, the volcano plot suggests that although there is a certain change in the, in the delta map, but it is not significant. And we ran PyCone and we see that there is the, the cluster is also somewhat remain similar. So this is now converting the variant relief frequency, adjusting it for copy number and arriving at the cellular prevalence. And we see that across different time points, the cluster composition remains somewhat similar. And uh, apart from doing barcode sequence, apart from doing whole exome, we also did barcode sequencing. And you see that, the, again, the three different time points are represented here. And uh, we see that the density plots are quite similar, suggesting again that the, the barcode composition is also not changing. However, if you see the unique number of barcodes, they do decrease that the AC regrown tumors, at least in certain models, have lower number of total barcodes. And we saw we actually saw a similar thing when we looked at these two patients in Artemis, Art6 and Art57, that at the mid-treatment, comparing pre and mid-treatment time points, we do see the one example in Art6 where the orange subclone decreases, but overall the, the clonal architecture does not change as much. It does change somewhat, but not as much. Of course, there would be some differences between PDXs and patients. Uh, one of the signatures which came up was oxidative phosphorylation at the uh, after the AC treatment, and we actually tested it since uh, Traction and IAX have developed a drug for for oxidative phosphorylation. What we see is that uh, represented in green and orange, these are the set of mice which were created with AC, or with, uh, which were treated with AC and then and then uh, the oxfos inhibitor, and we see that the the percentage of the percentage starting tumor volume is actually uh, different and, and we are able to impact the tumor size and also we are able to impact the survival of these mice. We went further and then also studied metastasis in this in, in these the same set of uh, tumor models. The, the several questions are, among several questions one of them are you know, is it that the certain subclones are able to create a distance metastasis? And also, what's the path? Is it that first you have a local metastasis and then there is reseeding and creation of distance metastasis? Is there an organ tropism that, you know, certain uh, sites have enrichment of certain subclones? Or is it that we see the same exact subclones everywhere across all sites? These are sorts of questions where this lineage tracing can be really helpful. So, Following a similar system as shown in, in the previous slides, uh, the after selection, a cohort of mice was created and the, the, the tumors were allowed to metastasize without treatment. And uh, we, we saw metastasis in liver, lung, and brain. And several metastases. So in case of uh, RNA-seq and whole exome sequencing, we, we took only a few uh, lung or liver metastases. But in terms of barcodes, we, we extracted it and sequenced them separately as much as possible. In terms of the mutations, in contrary to what we saw with AC treatment, we actually do see a significant difference in variant allele fractions comparing the mammary fat pad versus, say, lung, uh, the, the, the lung metastasis. And in terms of RNA-seq, what we see is an enrichment of ECM, uh, connective tissue, blood vessel, cell matrix interaction in the metastatic sites, which makes sense. Using PyClone, we can also study how the how specific clusters are changing. And we see that this green cluster is somewhat sensitive and is not able to grow in, in lung tissue, whereas the one represented in, in light blue, uh, cluster four, is something which has a specific advantage in metastasizing and is the one which creates the lung, uh, lung metastasis. To go further, we, we are also able to use the barcodes. And here what we show is the number of dominant barcodes on the left. And we see that the number of dominant barcodes are decreasing once we move to the lung, liver, and brain. And, and also 
we can see that using density plots uh, on the on on the top what we see is that for mouse c the reference population in the in the memory fat pad and there is a strong enrichment in these metastatic sites which is represented by a shift towards the right so here the x axis represents counts per million represented in a log 10 scale and we see a strong shift where only a certain fraction of clones are able to, able to metastasize and create the tumors now, apart from looking just at the distribution, we can also track specific lineages. So here we are looking at the top lineages and represent color coded. Uh, what we see is it's actually the same set of lineages which are represented in lung and liver, the yellow, orange, purple, the numbers and the fractions also remain somewhat similar. Although they are a rare fraction, but it's very interesting to note that at least in lung and liver, there is a lack of evidence of organ tropism. However, in the same mouse, in brain, this, this one specific tissue has a very different pattern. Uh, the top lineages are actually very different in, in, in the brain, suggesting that there is evidence of organ tropism. Now we can go further and look at these patterns across uh, mouse A, B, C, and D, and uh, brain is represented in purple. And we do see in mouse B, C, and D, that there are certain lineages which are selectively which are selectively enriched in brain and not so much in the liver and lung tissue to summarize we are able to create clonal replica tumors which consist of long term self renewing clones and uh, there is a molecular heterogeneity which exists in in these uh, and we can evaluate, for example, gem cytobine response and understand what pathways were enriched in, in gem resistant clones and what pathways were, were uh, depleted in, in the same set of clones. We were able to create a predictive signature to understand and to stratify patients based on treatment resistance. In triple negative breast cancer, as everybody appreciates this is heterogeneous disease, we're able to find a reversible drug resistant state. Uh, on in our experimental models using chemotherapy and we were able to extend the survival by targeting pathways such as oxfords the the metastasis in breast is often seeded by thousands of clones however the it seems that only the rare subclones persist uh, basically using the system by isolating we are able to understand the the somatic mutations copy number and oncogenic pathways which are leading to resistant mechanisms and designed rational combinations to uh, combining drugs which were, would not only impact one population, but distinct different populations of, of subclones. And then finally have a minimal residual disease or actually uh, you know, create pathological complete response. Uh, that's about it. And finally, I would really like to acknowledge uh, Julio's lab, Andrea's lab, for uh, they have been excellent collaborators, and also folks in Andy Future Labs uh, helping in the uh, pre-processing of, of the tumors. Uh, Pipnika Worms Lab, Gloria, Emily, who who were uh, who led the analysis, uh, who led the experimental design for the, the breast tissue, and uh, folks at Traction and uh, several clinicians who aided in uh, providing us with the experimental models, and of course, patients for generously donating the, the tumors. Thank you. Thank you, Sahil, for that fantastic and insightful presentation. Please don't forget to submit your questions for Sahil using the question option at the bottom of your menu display. We'll now move on to our second speaker, Paul Deal, Chief Operating Officer at Selecta. Paul joined Selector in July 2010 and has since applied over two decades of experience in biotechnology to developing and expanding the company's commercial and collaborative activities. Prior to joining Selector, Paul held various marketing and business development positions at Beebridge International, Agilent Technologies, and Clontech Laboratories, to name a few. Paul received his BA in Biology from La Salle University in Philadelphia and his PhD in Biochemistry from Washington State University in Pullman. Paul, 
over to you. Thank you everyone for tuning into the webinar today. And thank you, Sahil, for sharing your experience using the barcoded clone tracker libraries. Before we take questions, I'd like to give a very brief overview of who Selecta is and what we do. We're a small technology focused company just south of San Francisco in the Bay Area, in the um, Mountain View, California. We're not a venture funded company. Our company started about 12 years ago with seed money from research grants which we use to fund and develop technology and products for a functional genetic screening. Products that help identify genes responsible for disease progression, drug resistance, and cell differentiation and development. In particular, the goal was to create technology platforms that enable broadly parallel simultaneous analysis of large numbers of genes at once, a genome-wide analysis approach, but that use technology that does not require large-scale automation, limb systems, or industrial infrastructure that only a few labs have, large pharmaceutical labs and, and biotech labs mostly. Our aim is to provide tools that can be used by a wide range of more traditional laboratories, basic research labs that are familiar with standard molecular and cellular biology techniques. As NGS capabilities have increased, so has the ability to deconvolute results from complex biological assays and measure many simultaneously, measure simultaneously many thousands of assays in parallel using NGS as a readout. And then the, uh, it's possible to pull out results from thousands of individual reactions at once and track changes in multiple samples, treatments, or time points. We've had some success with this approach. Here's a sample of some of the publications over the years that we that have cited um, that have been cited using our technology from customers or groups that we've collaborated with. We have more complete and updated list of citations on our website. The link is shown on the slide. I would encourage you to take a look. It has a search function, and if there are particular applications, cell systems, or procedures you're interested in, you may be able to find relevant studies you can use as a resource for your experiments. The first platform that I'd like to talk about today is the driver map expression profiling asset. This platform enables you to get data on which genes are activated or deactivated in different samples or under different treatments from uh, a cell culture, a biopsies, patient-derived material, etc. Probably the most common approach to look at changes in gene expression on a global or genome-wide scale is RNA sequencing. While RNA sequencing is a very powerful approach, it is somewhat technically complex, and some challenges in prepping and running samples um, are uh, evident in the procedure. It, it's uh, pretty involved, actually, to run. And since it requires reverse transcribing and sequencing the whole transcriptome, data analysis is also somewhat intensive and requires a bioinformatics pipeline, really, to be able to um, align and uh, understand which genes are regulated uh, in different samples. You really need to establish a robust pipeline um, involving several individuals to really um, run this technique effectively on large numbers of samples. For expression profiling, though, for small numbers of genes, the gold standard still really is QRT-PCR. It's very straightforward and quantitative, and it gives you accurate, robust measurements of each targeted transcript. With the driver map platform, we combined QRT-PCR the simplicity and sensitivity of that technique with uh, more um, uh, with NGS sequencing so that you can get data on a genome-wide level similar to what you would get from RNA-seq. We were able to do this by developing a set of 38,000 primers that amplify 80 to 200 nucleotides of all 19,000 protein coding genes. So there are 19,000 primer sets in a single RT-PCR reaction that are used to amplify these amplicons. And this is all done in a single multiplex uh, system. The result is starting with total RNA, you can run a single RT-PCR reactions and get 19,000 amplicons that you would then load onto a next generation sequencing platform and sequence and count the number of reads of each amplicon for each gene. And this tells you the expression level then for each one of those targets. The advantages of this approach are that since it's PCR-based, it's very sensitive, 
It provides robust genome-wide profiles for a small number of samples down to picogram amounts of total RNA. We routinely run this on uh, single cells or just a few cell samples as shown here in the slide. While 19,000 amplicons may seem like a lot to sequence, it is much less than RNA-seq analysis in which the whole transcriptome, the whole fragmented transcriptome is reverse transcribed. As a result, we get much deeper sequencing and stronger reads of low expressed genes, even with five times fewer reads. As shown here, you can see that uh, the RNA sequencing done at 25 million reads uh, loses a lot of the low expressed genes, whereas the driver map technique um, using just 5 million total reads for the sample, um, you're able to pick up a much better uh, complement of these low expressed transcripts. It's very easy to run the driver map assay uh, since it does start with uh, total RNA. A single RT-PCR with the targeted primers is all that's required. There's no mRNA enrichment, beta globin depletion, et cetera, in terms of prepping the samples. So you just start with total RNA. It's a one-day RT-PCR reaction. Then the next step is sequencing. And then since the analysis um, is more straightforward, since you're looking at really only 19,000 transcripts, which may seem like a lot, but as I mentioned, um, for next generation sequencing, it's much less complex than the complete reverse transcription of the uh, transcriptome using RNA-seq. You can directly correlate each one of the amplicons with the expression level of the target. And that way, uh, the analysis can be done really on a spreadsheet. So depending on what you're interested in, DriverMap can provide a much more straightforward and effective approach to profile and correlate genome-wide changes in gene expression with different phenotypes of interest. While DriverMap and other expression profiling techniques provide an understanding of which genes are up and down regulated in conjunction with changes or the presence of different phenotypes in different samples, transcriptome analysis does not tell you which genes are actually important for driving phenotypic changes which genes are activated or deactivated that are important for the biological changes of interest. Addressing this question requires disrupting or perturbing particular genes to see if they have an effect on the phenotype of interest. Really, there are only two technologies that enable this sort of gene disruption analysis to be done on a whole transcriptome level, RNAi and CRISPR. And this is because with both of these technologies, it's possible to use a single common method uh, and a gene database um, of sequences to design reagents, similar sets of reagents, shRNA or RNA, sgRNA, um, that can be introduced into a large population of cells and disrupt or otherwise perturb different individual target genes in each cell. The CRISPR pooled screening approach is a very powerful approach to identify genes responsible for driving biological changes. The most common application of this approach is the one um, that uses the CRISPR sgRNA technology to identify genes that are essential for cell viability. The CRISPR screen approach is basically the same. First package the library as lentiviral particles and then introduce these into a cell population. And you infect your cells such that most of the cells pick up at least one uh, the most the, the cells pick up only one uh, lentiviral particle with one sgRNA. If you're looking for an essential gene, then the sgRNA that are targeting essential genes in the cell will be toxic and they will kill the cell. And in fact, then after a period of growth, uh, they will be depleted in the population because the cells that they're in die out. And so this depletion can be detected using uh, next generation sequencing. Genomic DNA is isolated from the samples, uh, amplified, the sgRNA sequences are amplified, and then the uh, sequenced, and then the sgRNA that are underrepresented in the population, in the experimental population versus the original library are ones that are important um, for, uh, sorry, are ones that are targeting genes that are important for cell viability. This sort of screen is useful to detect genetic vulnerabilities in cancer populations. It's also often used to identify genes that confer resistance to uh, various uh, therapies or treatments. 
to identify genes that um, enable cells to be resistant to a particular drug or compound. However, other screening approaches, such as looking at overrepresented acid gRNA um, when cells are treated to kill most of the um, cells in a population, or fact sorting cells can be used uh, to look for uh, other types of genes that are required for activation of a particular pathway or for a mechanism of action for a particular drug or factor. The technology that we use to make sgRNA and shRNA is not limited, of course, to those types of DNA sequences. With some cloning tricks, as shown on the left, or, sorry, on the right of the slide here, um, we can use some, uh, we can use we can make libraries with millions of defined sequences or barcodes. As Sahil showed, these type of libraries can then be transduced and used to uniquely label hundreds of thousands of cells in a population to create a founder population of cells. Since the barcodes are lentiviral vectors, they're integrated into the genome and they're heritable. So once the founder population is created, as they propagate, all the progeny from each one of the founder cells that's barcoded are also labeled with the same barcode. This type of labeling can be useful in a number of applications. This type of approach can be used to look at cell heterogeneity and cell pools in a population. For example, to look at how, how a population of cells change over time um, with differentiation or implantation, as Sahil showed excellently in the study that he just presented. Also, whether certain populations have specific characteristics that increase their ability, um, increase or decrease their ability to survive drug treatment or other selections. Also, on a single cell level with a single cell platform, such as the 10X system, genomic barcodes in the cell can be correlated with the activity of particular genes or changes in specific expression profiles and grouped then by subpopulations or sets of founder cells. It's also possible to add sgRNA into the mix too and look at how different subpopulations respond or are created when certain genetic changes are purposely introduced. This is related to the perturb seek, crop seek, CRISPR-seq type methods that you may have uh, heard of. If you're familiar with these approaches, then um, you can see that by linking the sgRNA that will induce specific changes into a cell population um, and linking that with the barcodes in the cell, um, you're able to then correlate changes, specific changes with um, certain changes in the um, uh, expression level of those cells. So this was just intended to be a quick overview of the capabilities and technology that Select offers. If you're interested in discussing any of these technologies further or getting more information, please contact me. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Again, I'd like to thank you all for tuning into the webinar this afternoon, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you, Paul, for that great presentation. Okay, now we open the floor to questions. Please don't forget to submit your questions for Sahil and for Paul using the question option at the bottom of your menu display. So we have a question, first of all, for Sahil. So Sahil, you had tested three drugs using the clonal tracking system. Is this scalable to testing more drugs? Hi, uh, just wanted to check you can hear me, right? Yes, Sahil, we can hear you. Perfect. Yes, so uh, we were able to create a cohort of uh, about 12 mice, and that allowed us, uh, using three replicates, to test the three drugs. But certainly it is possible to, if you start with a larger batch, to expand it uh, a, a bit further, possibly five, six drugs. Uh, beyond that, we uh, currently have not uh, tried expanding it, it as, as much. Uh, but certainly since the, the CRTs are quite similar, it's possible to use and, and redo the experiment with a new set of, uh, of barcodes and test another set of three drugs, four drugs. Uh, it would be good to have at least one drug which is common across different experiments so that you can uh, compare how the lineages react to each of these drugs. Great, thank you for that. Okay, our second question. Um, the long-term self-renewing cells are able to sustain over passages. Are these same? Sorry, are these the same as stem cells? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. So, uh, 
you know, in, in the field, when folks talk about stem cells, it's, uh, it, it, uh, it specifically mentions, you know, tumor initiating cells uh, and the ability to, to transplant and create a, a tumor in, in mice. What we saw was it's the same set of cells which get enriched in vivo and also in vitro. So that's why we are referring to them as long term self renewing. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, yes, these are the same set of, there is a common set of lineages which get. Uh, passaged in vitro and in vivo. So these are most likely the, the cancer stem cells. That's great. Thank you very much, Sahil. Um, so our third question is, so how were the clones with specific DNA barcodes isolated from the bulk? Right. So so the information we have is, is the specific DNA barcode for, for every clone. However, you know, cells do not express, of course, they don't express that DNA marker. So there is no way to, to in a high throughput manner, to extract specific cells with, with a barcode. So what we did was we used uh, limited dilution. So initially 5,000 cells were plated in a, in a 96 well plate in each well. Uh, you can use 96 well, 380, 384 well plate, however, and several plates were plated. And those which grew were then uh, cells from each well was were then plated to another plate, and this time only one cell was plated in each well. So now we were able to create colonies from a single cell, and then not then each of these cells were combined and barcoded separately. Uh, each of these wells were uh, barcoded separately and then sequenced using iron torrent, and then the barcodes from each well were mapped to the lineages we wanted to extract. Uh, finally, we went back to the second set of plates where we had a single cell colonies and, uh, and expanded them to create lineages uh, derived from single cells. Great, thank you very much. Um, we'll end the webinar with just one final question. Um, okay, so for the barcoded breast cancer xenografts, you noted that there were distinct differences in the gene expression patterns of the pretreated residual and regrown tumor cells after treatment. However, with regard to mutations, the whole genome sequencing didn't show any sort of trend or patterns. Does this indicate that mutations do not play a significant role in tumor adaption to drugs? Now that's an interesting question. So um, in this, in this set of model, well, we this is what we saw. Uh, however, there have been other experiments where mutations have, in fact, played a role. Because, for example, if we look at the AML case in, in the clinic, it was really uh, the relapse was caused by just 5% of the clones. Uh, again, I think it depends on the, on the tumor. In this context, it seems that the tumor was already resistant to chemotherapy. So basically all the subpopulations were resistant, although they shrank and adapted uh, by changing the transcription profile. All of them have had the same ability to regrow when given a chance. However, it, even in triple negative breast cancer, uh, I've been looking at some, some data from, from the, uh, a clinical, the Artemis clinical trial. And in some of the patients, we do see that there are differences in uh, after AC treatment in, in patients. So it really depends on the context. It really depends, is the starting population of cells really resistant or is it a subclone which is resistant and rest of them are sensitive? Great, very interesting. Thank you very much, Sahil. Okay, so that takes us to the end of the Q&A session. If you'd like further information on Sir Hill's publication, then please download using the link within this presentation. Oxford Global will also send this link to you alongside the full recording of today's webinar. If you would like further information regarding this year's Next Genomics UK virtual event, please visit the website or contact myself on the email address within this presentation. 
On behalf of Voxel Global, I'd like to thank Sahil and Paul for taking time out for taking time out to present on this webinar. I hope that you found this insightful, interesting and relevant to your line of work. Thank you all for attending and have a lovely rest of your day.